Calvin Lumper. I'm Sam Messias. Bonjour, je m'appelle Mademoiselle Cotoni. Hi, I'm Senora Lennon. Salve, sono Signora D'Alessandro. And I'm Mr. Gorlick. Chapter 6, How Many? Sunday and Monday, July 1st to the 2nd. Sunday, July 1st, inside. On Sunday, three teams of divers were back in the water laying line from where operations had halted the previous day. Each pair would need to swim out laying line, then return. Because so much of the cave system was now flooded, they had to begin at chamber three and travel the entire route. Raymanance and the French diver Maxime Poliaka went first and reached somewhere between chambers four and five. A pair of Thai seal divers took the next shift. Then Stanton and Volanthin finally managed to reach the T-junction, but did not yet attempt to cross it. They had run out of line. What Stanton calls the tricky navigational bit lay just past where the two streams joined. The current flowing down the Monk series was clearer and noticeably warmer than the current coming from the passage to Pattaya Beach and beyond, which was muddy and close to 73 degrees Fahrenheit, 23 degrees Celsius, the same as the overall temperature of the main cave. The British team were wearing thin and frayed wetsuits uh, that offered the little warmth, but they were used to these conditions and considered them comfortable. Outside, 8.30 p.m. The Chinese green boat team got the most exciting, most urgent phone call. One of the rescuers combing the hills had heard a tapping coming from underground. Were the boys alive? Had they managed to make so much noise that it could be heard even through the rock? Could this be kind of a code rumbling from inside the limestone prison? The Chinese rescuers rushed out into the night, thrashing through the pineapples, scampering up cliffs, following a Thai guide. Scraped by sharp leaves, battered by falls, they pressed on but did not find anything. They were not even sure they were in the right place. The team checked back with the original caller, and when they compared GPS locations, found out they were miles off target. Indeed, there was no real target. The sound was not the echo of the boys scraping at the rocks, but a river rushing through the caves. Discouraged, the Chinese returned to their camp to rest and recover. Rolling camera one. Action. Monday, July 2nd, inside. Leading off the day's dives, Remnants and Palika followed the line the British team had laid on Sunday afternoon. The British team had reached to within 30 feet, nine meters of that difficult point, just past the T junction. This, as Stanton describes it, was like being at a crossroads with additional blind exits, plus all exits being at differing levels to each other. The two divers crossed through the puzzling space and laid about another 377 feet, 115 meters of line. That put them at the same point where the seals had left their marker in the early days. The team attached their line and swam back. Now, the British divers left chamber three and began the long swim. To handle these difficult dives, some used a spatial apparatus called a rebreather, which allows a diver to go longer on a single canister. But Stanton and Volanthin didn't want the additional drag against the current that came with the bulkier equipment. Stanton and Volanthin reached the T-junction and made their way through the crossroads and blind exits. They reached the end of Remnant's rope and the seal sign. They were making progress, but that also meant they were coming to the end. It is one thing to be blocked from entering a cave where people are lost. It's another to be swimming closer hour by hour, minute by minute, 
to learning their fate. According to one diver, the Thais wanted to ensure the last push be led by a Thai medic who could speak with the team and assess their condition. William Stone, the cave rescue expert, has said that when there is a search whose every step is covered by the hungry media, there is always tension over the trophy. Whoever makes the final discovery gets the press, the attention, the praise for his or her nation. As the divers pressed on, someone would, and someone wouldn't, be that person. If you cared about the trophy, the winner would soon be decided. But even for those who didn't, diving onwards brought new pressures. Images haunted the Lanthans and Stanton's mind. They kept picturing the boy swept up, overcome, drowned by the tidal surges. Around the next corner might be 13 floating bodies. In 2012, Stan received a high honor the member of the most excellent order of the British Empire, for, finding, for trying to find and save the French diver Eric Estably, who was lost in a cave. Stanton was only able to recover Estably's body. Belanthin recalled leaving for another dive with three people in a car and only returning with two. They were realists navigating the darkness. Every time they sensed an air pocket above the water, they would raise their heads out and look, afraid of what they might see. The divers reached and passed Bataya Bay. Nothing, no sign of Ek and the team. They swam on, laying line. 100 meters, 200, 300, 400, 500. They were running out of rope. Very soon, for their own safety, they would need to turn around, go back. An air pocket. Stan Stanson raised his head to look around then took off his face mask to sniff the air for any trace of human scent. Until now, water rushing through the caves had kept the air clear. The smell was overwhelming, like an outhouse. Someone was here, or had been here. There they are, he said. We found them. Found whom? Found what? The odor said people had been there. Silence. No sounds. No sign of the team. The team. One shift was doing its work scraping at the rocks when they heard something, voices. Ek told everyone to be silent so they could listen. The boys went still. Yes, they were right. They were hearing voices, conversation. Abdul grabbed a flashlight and came down the wedge of sand to see who, what was in the water. The dive. The lanthorn swam closer, the camera on his helmet filming. Stanton was scanning the steep, sandy slope and keeping a tally of the boys. One by one, the boys and Eck were rounding a bend out of the darkness and edging down the thin wedge of slope toward the light. Contact. How many of you? The lanthorn asked. They're all alive, Stanton exclaimed. His count had told him that already. Thirteen, a duel. The one team member who spoke English replied, Brilliant! The boys began speaking to one another in Thai as Adul and Valanthan exchanged words in English. Thank you, thank you. Outside? Not today. Just two of us. You have to dive. The diver says not today. We're coming. It's okay. Many people are coming. Many, many people. We are the first. What day? Tomorrow. No, what day is it? Monday. Who can speak English? Please help translate. Monday, but one week, Monday. You have been here 10 days. You are very strong, very strong. We come, we come. We are hungry. I know, I understand. Eat, eat. We haven't eaten at all. We come here tomorrow. We hope tomorrow. Navy SEALs will come tomorrow with food and doctors and everything. Have a light? We'll give you more lights. We are happy. We are happy too. Thank you so much. Where are you from? England, the UK. Beyond all hope, all 13 were alive. Very thin, all bones and knobby knees, but smiling, seemingly healthy and in good spirits. But from the first second, the divers realized that they were facing a new crisis. How could they possibly get these skeletal young men out? 
For two of the very best, most experienced cave divers in the world, the trip from the base camp had taken two and a half hours of squeezing, wiggling, navigating through tight, treacherous caverns. Could 13 frail young men with no diving experience at all, much less cave diving under the most hazardous conditions, undertake that journey? That night, six Thai SEALs adopt their pack Moharmshun, who had received SEAL training but became an army doctor equipped with four oxygen tanks, set out to follow the five-hour round trip from Chamber 3 to the boys and back. Five hours passed, six, eight, nine, 23 hours later, SEALs returned, totally exhausted. They had each used three tanks just to reach the boys, so only a few were willing the chance coming back on a single tank. SEALs in peak physical condition could barely complete the dive. As cave diver Jason Mallinson put it, getting 13 people out of the cave would not be difficult. Getting them out alive was another challenge entirely. At 9.30 that night, Governor Osutong Nakorn was holding an important, difficult meeting. Meteorologists were reporting that worse weather and even bigger storm was on the way. The boys and Eck had been gone for 10 days. For 10 days, the governor had done everything he could, could to give people hope, to rally their spirits, to encourage them to trust. But 10 days was a long time to go without food. And if the new storm made the caves even more impassable, how could the boys survive? What could the governor and his team possibly say to everyone tomorrow? A Thai SEAL arrived and asked the governor to step out of the meeting. He had news. The boys had been found and they were alive. Governor Osatana Korn was not sure whether to trust the news, but he decided he could not take the time to confirm the story. Instead, he sought out the parents and told them, we found your kids healthy, alive. Then at 10 p.m. he made the announcement to the world. The press burst in into cheers. Major Hodges and his team immediately realized that their mission had totally changed. Searching outside across the hills was over. Now all their attention must be on the chambers and passages within the caves. He and his key people rushed to the cave mouth to meet the British divers and tie seals and plan. <laughs>